Good morning, everybody. So thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate everyone jumping on today. We again apologize for the technical difficulties yesterday, but we're excited to have you here today as Sterling welcomes Jeff Jennings, who's the National Senior SLED Practice Director for Fortinet. So welcome, Jeff. Real quick, I'm gonna read through your bio and then we'll go ahead and get it kicked off. So Jeff has over 26 years of experience working with the SLED sectors, K-12 education and higher ed and state and local government. Jeff has dedicated his career to gaining expertise in the FCC E-rate program, as well as other federal programs and sharing that knowledge with organizations that need help navigating these complex programs. He has served in a consulting capacity across federal, state, county, and city governments. His background also includes state, multi-state, and federal contracts and compliance regulations. Jeff's extensive E-rate experience has allowed him to consult with more than 750 schools. He has also engaged with more than 200 manufacturers and resellers, participating in programs such as rural broadband, USDA, VTOP, FCC, RHC, and E-rate programs. With a strong record of consultative service to local and state districts and education agencies ranging from small to very large agencies and school districts, Jeff's been able to help hundreds of organizations with the strategic planning and RFP creation and response that enables the digital transformation in the SLED vertical. So Jeff, welcome. Thank you again for joining us, and we're going to go ahead and kick it off because I know you have a ton of stuff that you would like to present today. Thank you very much, and I'm very glad we're able to get back together. And if you've got any questions uh, that you would like answers, please make please make those available. This is about you and how we can assist you. So uh, let's go ahead and move forward. And enough talk about me. Uh, really, today we want to talk about where K-12 higher ed, state, and local government are and also what's coming down the pipe. Uh, there's a lot going on in, behind the beltway right now, as well as the funding that's already been put out for all of the public sector. It's the most money ever in the public sector. The next closest would be post-World War II, and even with inflation, this is exponentially larger than that. So we're gonna talk about the, where the current state and funding is, the cybersecurity issues, including the new cybersecurity law that's going to affect all, all public sector, the budgets and the funding, and then the next steps for making a plan and getting ready not only to make, get your fair share of the, of the funding uh, for the IT and ed tech and government technology, but also for planning for the next round. And we'll talk about how to be more assertive about that and, and the plans that seem to be working as we've now met 934 times uh across the country since the pandemic started with all sorts of public sector and partners and it's been uh, a great big adaptation you've had to pivot you've had to move you've had to go do a whole new pedagogy and delivery system and you had to do it in the mountain manner of months there's never been a hyper transformation like that and that's give i want to give kudos to you uh, for being in the arena and if you've ever uh, heard Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena speech, that's you. And if you haven't heard it, please look up Teddy Roosevelt's the man in the arena. I very much appreciate that you are all staying in and fighting the good fight as we transition to a whole new way of, of life. Go ahead, next slide, please. So we'll, we'll talk about the schools right here. There's the challenges in the today's public schools. The 30% of K-12 students and 10%, that's an overall average, and it's actually proving to be pretty accurate. We've seen as low as 20%, we've seen as high as 80. But what typically when we're dealing with, on the K-12 level, it, it's right about 30% and 10% of the teachers, and that's a big deal. So uh, the cyber attacks that happened this last year, 408, Everyone feels that was underreported. That was only the publicly reported ones. We know that there's been others, and we know that uh, that is, we believe, going to be even more this year, because last year was an 18% over 2019, and 2019 was a record before that. And then we're already seeing states unveil budget cuts. In fact, there was an article today on the Cali on California K-12 schools going broke. 
Why? Because since the pandemic, there's been a big decrease in districts at LA Unified, San Francisco, the bigger cities uh, where they've lost, because people are more, more mobile now, they have lost large numbers of students. And as we all know, on the K-12 side, if you lose students, you lose average daily attendance and that funding goes down. So having to deal with that as well as everything else uh, means that we've got to be very prudent and very smart in how we go after and using the funding. But technology and the network is the key. To me, it's the central nervous system, the brain and the heart. Nothing happens in education. Nothing happens in government unless it's encased in an IP packet. The way we did government and education in February 2020 is long gone. So they put billions, billions, billions of infrastructure money in, and they're going to be adding billions and billions more. And so we've got, now that we've made this pivot, we've got to make sure that you're ready for the next decade, and you've got to make sure that you're able and secure to do that. So especially with shrinking budgets, that can be a challenge. Next slide, please. So the key K-12 cybersecurity, uh, you've got to ensure the physical and, and cyber safety for your children because you're, you're held accountable, not only with SEPA, but also with any, now that you've got a broadened attack surface all the way to the home, frankly, you've got a lot of responsibility exponentially more than you ever had before. And so you're having to make sure the physical and cyber security and cyber safety for the children, you've got to do this and be cost effective at the same time, pivoting to a complete digital learning transformation, a new platform or several platforms, and that whole pedagogy and not to count the professional development that's needed for the educators to be able to understand and embrace that new pedagogy and the delivery system that is so crucial, you're the key to make that happen, you and your team. And then with IT, you exponentially increase the number of devices. And you also exponentially increase the, the amount of traffic running through your network. And so you're, you're now having to do everything. And, and, and in the new cybersecurity law, we'll talk in a minute, you're going to be learning a whole lot more having to go all the way to the edge and what the new edge of that network is and how you're going to have to secure it. And then you're still going to have to do all kinds of maintaining compliance and demonstrating compliance and have that level of reporting that you can get and pass on, whether it be local, state, federal, uh, what's going on, you're also gonna have to be accountable for those funds uh, that you're using for it. So other than the exponential increase in, in work and the inability to be able to add more staff, um, there's not any stress at all. I'm kidding, there's a ton, uh, both on education and on the government side. Uh, very few people got to add any, any personnel to their staff but they sure got to add exponentially more devices than they were expecting in the next few years. And you have to do it in a few months. Next slide, please. So one, there's been both a federal cybersecurity law and a K-12 cybersecurity law. This is setting the table for what's coming next. And so the federal cybersecurity law includes contractors and everybody, everybody serving the federal government. And that's a pretty extensive act. I've read through it time and time again. But what we need to be made aware of, both for the state, local government, on, the, on that law, is that's going to trickle down there. And just like the K-12 cybersecurity law, they're, they're very similar in this function, that the director of cybersecurity, which is a new, it's called CISA, the new cybersecurity infrastructure agency, they're going to have a CISA czar, a cybersecurity czar. Somebody's going to be in charge. They're going to have 120 days to study the specific risks impacting K-12. Similarly, they're doing the same thing at the federal level and, and also following that at the state and local government level. So that clock is already ticking. Uh, that started a week ago, Friday, or a week ago. Today is Friday, week, last week. So, and the, the federal started week before that. So once they get that study done, they're going to have 60 days to issue recommendations. These are going to be voluntary secure cybersecurity guidelines that uh, schools can, can implement. Notice the word can and not will. That is slowly going to transition to will because what's happening now in realistic terms 
And the same thing with federal government and the state and local that deal with the feds, those voluntary recommendations that the CISA is going to be putting out will later become hopefully funded mandates and not unfunded mandates, but you need to be ready for that. And so the, after 60 days, they're going to have this come out and then the, they're going to put together a training toolkit. They're going to put together a playbook. But what it's going to be coming down to, and, and in fact, in the infrastructure bill, they weave cybersecurity through it all over the place. That's the new bill that's going to be coming by the end of the year is what the current plan is. That calls out cybersecurity in a lot of the funding areas, a lot of the funding areas that are going to affect you. So you need to be ready for it because trying to be reactional is going to be much, more, much, much harder than if you're proactive. So we've got some ideas for that for you as well. Next slide, please. So with schools, uh, let me move that my little window that I have to stare at myself, which is disconcerting. Uh, the step, steps that we would recommend, and we're going to go talk about education and K-12 as we're talking about K-12, is create a cyber-informed culture by ensuring staff and students are trained on best practices. One thing that you're going to have to do, if you haven't already aggressively addressed it, is cyber hygiene. Cyber hygiene is the leading reason why ransomware uh, is, a, is being so effective in, in locking away school districts. We had one here in Bakersfield, Panama, Buena Vista, uh, who the superintendent I've known for a long time, it was somebody who inadvertently, it looked like it was a legitimate email, clicked on it, that was on a Friday, and they didn't exit out and shut down the machine and it took over. And it happened in Baltimore. Baltimore, it happened in Atlanta it, 408 times. Uh, not all of them ransomware, but 60% of them were that we know of. And so that cyber hygiene and being able to understand that and in just those basic practices. And frankly, well, we have a book, uh, uh, a kid's book that, that teaches them through it. It's really cute and it's done really well. But we also, what we're doing is since the pandemic and it's been, and it's blown up so big. And in fact, in Texas, 23 uh, city and county agencies were taken down on the same weekend by ransomware, by an innocent clicking on what appeared to be a legitimate email. In fact, it was spear phishing and phishing that caused it to happen. And you'll learn more how to do that uh, as you take these courses. But we opened up our national security, our NSE, our National Security Academy with full certifications for free, which is normally kind of expensive. Uh, we've had, we're now verging on 1.5 million since the pandemic, since we made that free. Uh, in fact, I've got four calls later today uh, with junior colleges and school districts because they're implementing that. So think about that because there's absolutely zero cost and the lower level, it's very, it works at a very easy, a little bit more comprehensive as the levels go up to level eight to really high end. But the first two would be great for, for in not only making it for your students, but for your staff. Uh, who aren't necessarily technical, but find a source to do that. The other thing you're going to need to do is prioritize the endpoint. Remember I talked about how it's reaching out to the household and that's the new attack surface. So we already know that the feds are going to be, they've already brought it up and they're already bringing up more endpoint security, what we call EDR, uh, in our security fabric is, is that's what we, we we're, We've seen a 40% increase in EDR over last year, which was a previous year of people deploying it because they need it for all these Chromebooks and things. So that's been a huge issue and you can definitely take advantage of that. And we're showing the fund, we're gonna talk about the funding, how to do that, but make sure you've got those endpoints covered. Ensure that your network permissions are cleaned up and current because if there's any legacy ways to get in, if there's any old credentials, uh, if you've been uh, attacked before and successfully they got in and removed any or, or were able to grab any of the personal information, you need to make sure that those network permissions are up to date. The other thing is patch, 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 update your whatever cybersecurity, whether it's a firewall and you just have a simple firewall or a next gen firewall or a full fabric make sure and have a regular cadence of updating because 
we have like for us, we have almost 800 um, uh, security engineers, uh, great big propellers on their head. All they do, and we work with Interpol, we have, that, that we back them up, is find all of the recent threats, all the recent issues. And if you ever want to look up Forta Labs and just put in, and and Google that, you'll see all kinds of stuff that that is very technical, but you'll see how bad it is. And um, I would definitely make sure that you're doing your patching because not doing the patching is what allowing a lot of a lot of schools and government to be taken over. And then you start right now with your incident response plan. So who's going to be in charge? Because you're going to have to have a person who's in charge of security. Typically, that's going to fall on the network person. So add a 12th hat to the hats that you already have and that your team's wearing. But make sure that you have an updated incident response plan and use some of the funding now and the funding coming uh, because you can absolutely use that funding for it. Make sure that you have not only upgraded your network and prepared it for all the massive increase in, in traffic, but also that you had a comprehensive security transformation that is even stronger than your digital transformation. Because they're gonna they're, they're attacking you all the time. And in fact, if you ever want to Google Fortinet threat map, uh, that is that that is a live interactive map that shows a fraction of 1% of the actual attacks that our FortiGates are rebuffing our, I think it's almost four and a half million FortiGates, something like that around the world. It's a global view and uh, it'll scare you to death because it's only a fraction of 1% because if we even just went up to 1%, you wouldn't be able to track all, where all the attacks are coming from. And if we open it up to 5%, it would just be a solid mass. But a fraction of 1% will give you a great idea on the number of attacks that are happening, not only around the world. By the way, US uh, is one of the worst at attacking both inside our borders and outside. And when I say US, the cyber thugs, not the government. So uh, check that out. And if you look at that, you'll understand why you need to update your incident response plan. Uh, next slide, please. So the number one issue always, and, and I'm glad the federal government responded, because back in the 1800s, it feels like I was an adaptive PE teacher, special ed teacher, coach football and other things, and then became an administrator. Number one issue facing any K-12 and any government is budget and cost. So costs are always going up. Budgets are always shrinking. But the good news is the funding is currently available. Because wouldn't you be able to do so many more things if you didn't have to worry about budget and cost? But the good news is this funding that came and the more funding that's coming is going to help you with that. And next slide, please. One of the other things that I hope you take advantage of, so this they started the Emergency Connect Fund as part of the Emergency Broadband Plan uh, this, this just over the last few months. The final window closed October 13th. If you took advantage of that program, to bridge the digital divide, good. The problem was it was panic buying and not competitive buying. And, and really what you were just trying to do was make it through the pandemic. So you didn't have to go out and, and analyze your best solutions. Normally, the, this is the same folks that run E-Rate. And normally you would have to do competition, you would have to do all these scopes and analysis, but really it was all about just making sure especially K-12, had the ability and the libraries had the ability to get the people Wi-Fi access, hotspots access. So this first year was kind of like the Wild West. It looks like in the new infrastructure bill coming that there are going to be at least $4 billion. And the, and the goal is to make this uh, five more years beyond this year. So a total of six, they put $7.1 billion in this year. Uh, and they had the two windows, one in August, uh, one that just closed on the 13th. Um, both of those, we think there's going to be more requests in round. So there's 5.134 billion requested of the 7.1 in the first round. And then the balance was put forward in the second round. We believe that they're simply just going to run out of budget and maybe halfway down. Who knows? We'll wait and see. But that's OK, because if you're as K-12 schools still need to be able to bridge that digital divide, 
your ESSER money, the elementary secondary school emergency relief plan, three buckets, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. ESSER 1 was CARES Act, ESSER 2 was CRRSA, and ESSER 3 was, was the uh, uh, broadband plan. So, or I'm sorry, the Biden plan. Uh, so you've got all three of those. And if you do need to be able to get those out to your staff and students, you don't have to wait for ECF. You can use some of those funds because again, there's been three buckets and many schools have only touched the first or the first and the second, and you're on a shot clock, but we'll talk about more about that. So don't be afraid to use the funding uh, that you got with ESSER to meet whatever needs you, you have. So you've got 15 areas of latitude, but we'll talk about more of that in a minute. And if you didn't get it this year, then make sure that you apply for it next year because what I think Congress's goal is going to be is you have E-rate for the internal network for K-12, you'll have ECF for off campus. And that's how they're really building this program. It's gonna stay under the FCC and it's going to stay with USAC uh, organizing and running it and doing all the policy and process and the applications. So anyway, make sure you're, you're aware of that. If you did grab a hold of it, great. If you didn't, you still got funding options to get you through this year and then you can also do it next year uh, once they get that set up. Next slide, please. So we talked about the buckets. And during the pandemic, you had ESSER 1, which was the CARES Act, 13.29 uh, billion for K-12. Uh, you had the second round, and that was, you have to spend, by the way, the first round by 9-30-2022, so September 30th, 2022. That's not that far away at all. And when we track this, and the USDOE has a tracking website that breaks it down by, by state, uh, all the way down into the LEA, to the local education agency, same thing with higher ed. Uh, very few have, very few, if any, have actually spent all of their first monies and their second monies that are in the process of doing, yet that you have to spend by 2023. And then the big bucket, the 128.6 billion has to be spent by 2024. And we're meeting with agencies and superintendents and LEAs, and some are not even aware of the third bucket. And they're, frankly, we've had some freak out that they're not gonna be able to spend the money. I can tell you as an administrator, especially on, on the side that I was on, I dealt almost exclusively with, with the, uh, the educational funding title one through title five. So what I never did was, give them a dime back. So if you don't spend the money in these buckets, the, the feds will take it back. Higher ed in the first round for the, for the HERE fund, the Higher, ed, higher Education Emergency Relief really Fund, they left a little over $6 billion on the table and the feds took it back at the deadline. So they will take that money back. Do not wait. Do not think that they'll let you just keep it. They absolutely will not. And then we've also had the Emergency Connect Fund, which started this year, which that window is closed, but you do. So plan A is if you did do ECF, you, that could be ECF, especially for bridging the digital divide. Plan B to supplement that, or in case you don't get funding, your ESSER funding can certainly be used for that. And then ESSER 3, by the way, is uh, what? S ESSER 2, let me do the math here, was almost was four point, almost 5.2 times more than the first round. And then almost a little over double the second round for round three. So those are very, very large numbers. And the part of the problem we're seeing is, and I hear this almost every day, is we're not sure what we can spend it on. Well, for the first time ever, the feds have given you the, the ability to use these funds with wide latitude. So for K-12 that's and higher ed, that's 15 areas of latitude uh, that you can spend the money on, PPE, staff bonuses, clean, cleaning up, more buses. Uh, in the first round, first two rounds, only 39% spent, spent any money on technology, which even though technology is written extensively into all three bills, all three buckets, K-12 has been reticent to do that. They finally started in the second round, some of the first, buying the Chromebooks and things. But please understand this, it is for 
the entire network and everything you need to do the business of education in a hybrid and remote way for remote learning, hybrid learning. And that's your all, everything, not only the Chromebooks and everything that you give out to the students and staff, but it's also for the infrastructure and the security uh, to make it happen. And you'll see here in, in a few minutes, I believe, but in the late, in one of the latest guidance, they listed uh, network infrastructure technology 41 times in the FAQs for allowable use, cybersecurity in its own section, A21, and then hotspots four times as well. So they're, they're wanting you to spend the money on technology because frankly, it's not going away. And you've got to have not only a network that can keep up, you've got a network, you need to be able to use this money to, to support and push it out several years because if you don't get the money this time around, Lordy help you because you're get, you're get, everybody's depending on your network and if the network goes down or if the network gets attacked, business of education and the process of education stops. And when you can't get your students online to meet the minimum number of hours, if they have any hybrid or remote, and we still see the variant impacting schools in 48 states, uh, we had wildfires here in California that are still burning. We had 19, we had 19 districts affected where they had to evacuate, send their kids remote. And if they, in California, I think it's three or three and a half hours, Illinois, I believe is two and a half. If the child isn't interacting and on it line during, during that, uh, with that amount of time minimum, then they lose their average daily attendance. They lose that money. And you, that's how education is paid is through average daily attendance, as you well know. So make sure that the lifeline that keeps everything running is is up not only up and performing but can handle the exponential load and is also safe and secure next slide please so also for government so you had some funding in the first round uh, which was great then the second round at the last minute government funding for state and local and county was taken away in lieu of stimulus checks. But in the third round, this last March, $350 billion for state and local government. And by the way, if you don't know how much that money is, we have the third round monies, both for education and by city, county, small cities, state, every K-12, every, high, every higher ed, all of those allocations from that third bucket. If you need that information, you can get that from Sterling. Sterling's been leading the charge in making sure that you are well informed and know the budgets. Because again, you have need in the cyber transformation. You have the availability to get budget, and those are the two biggest hurdles. So, 350 billion for state and local, 20 for tribal, 20 billion, and you can see the others there. So there are monies there. One thing that both for education and K-12. So the, this money is spent locally. And so the decisions are made locally. If you're not actively engaged with the decision makers, if you don't have a plan and you don't go get your, pay, your share of the pie, then you're gonna get whatever they think you might need when in actuality, if you do some, you know, I'm sure you've already done the planning, you know what you need. And this is where, frankly, the IT and the ed tech and the technology folks, this is where we have to, normally you're used to getting your budget and if it's K-12, uh, E-rate money. And then if it's higher ed, you get your budget and sometimes state or bonds come through for, for modernization infrastructure. And then with government, it's typically the same, you know, you get your budget. And again, if there's levies or bonds that are, that are attracted to that are a part of that, but this is different. You've got to go pursue it. You've got to be at the table. And, and this is where you have to become an advocate, not because you're just money hungry, but because your, your network is so crucial to making everything work and it's not going to change. So, and that's where Sterling does a great job of sitting down with you, which we'll talk more about in a minute and walking through all the issues, walking through all the needs and putting those all together and pre preparing a plan to take it to your boards, to your local agencies, and working with them to get you the funding that you need. Uh, so we'll talk about that more in a minute. Next slide. Here's an example of that spreadsheet that I was talking about. 
So this, this is by state, but it breaks it down. So you can look at Minnesota, for example, state government, 2.5 billion, the metro cities of Minnesota, half a billion, almost 600 million. Or, yeah, almost 600 million. Uh, local government, smaller government, 420 million. Counties, 1.1 billion. And then you jump over to elementary, 1.3 billion. And then you can jump over to the higher education, it's half a billion. And so for a total of 6.79, this may be hard to read, but Minnesota, for example, 6.796 billion, North Dakota, total of 1.746, but those breakouts, um, and, and Sterling has the, the sheet, all, has the tabs for each of those things. So you can look up and see where you're at. And this is from the feds. Now realize on education side, state takes, a, 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 I believe up to 10%. Uh, of your of your totals, but you can also find your exact totals at your State Department of Ed. Just look up ESSER, e -S -S -E and then capital I-I-I, uh, and then you can find that information out at the state level uh, because there's also a smaller governor's fund for education that they split between K-12 and higher ed. So um, there's a little bit more monies there, but this is the real deal, and this is very, very accurate. You can see South Dakota, 1.8 billion. Um, make sure that you're in talking about the money. If you're not having those conversations, then whatever you get, don't have a fit because you've got to go out there and you got to go get it. And this is the first time this has happened. And it's a whole different dynamic than you've ever had to do before. And if we, and if Sterling can help you do that and they can help you do that, then get a hold of us and we'll sit down. We'll have a conversation. We'll, we'll plan it out with you. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Next slide, please. So the reopen schools, the ARP plan, the American Rescue Plan, know that you've got latitude, like I said earlier, but provide students with computers and other digital devices and internet access. So a lot of schools and a lot of government too, with, with how wide latitude it is, they said, we can only buy computers with it. No, actually, you can buy the network infrastructure, the cybersecurity, like I said, in the guidance from USDOE. And if you would like a copy of that guidance, the FAQs that they released on that, uh, talk to Sterling and your reps, and we'll get that with you. And let's also just have time to talk. We're not going to try to sell you a widget. We're going to plan with you on how to go get this funding and what, how much funding you need, and both for the current funding that's available and the funding coming down the road. Uh, next slide, please. There's going to be more money coming. There's money now in the emergency broadband plan, and uh, you have money in ESSER. These are separate. That's gotten some people confused. So ESSER is money that goes down to the LEA, uh, you, and it depends on how your state ran it. Some made it easy to get the money for the LEA to the state. Some states made it way too difficult. California, my state is one of them. Florida is another. Uh, there, but and and they they put very tight deadlines, which actually caused the schools to miss some of that funding. So they had to go back and make it and redo it again, so the schools could have time because they were trying to have you go after this money right in the middle of trying to get school back in session for start school year, and so many people had burning fires all over the place with trying to go hybrid, trying to go remote, trying to go direct and then having to stop and start, and then the massive number of DDoS and cyber attacks that, for instance, um, uh, we saw Miami-Dade, they had great internal protection. By the way, they're, they're one of ours. What they didn't have was the vendor who was hosting their education platform that they had built. They had it outsourced to, to hold it because they didn't want the bandwidth to hit them. The vendor, frankly, had not done very well on the patching side. And so a junior in high school uh, was able to take the school's access down to that learning portal for a week. Um, they got it fixed. They got it secured. And same thing happened up in, in Maryland. Same thing happened in Texas. I mean, it happened in, the, in a ton of places. So uh, that was all going on at the same time you were supposed to be going and getting this funding. And now coming into the new rounds, there's going to be more broadband, at least 65 billion. And we're going to talk about more of that in a minute. 
you definitely got to spend that ESSER money now, one, two, and three, and absolutely technology needs to be getting part of that budget of all three buckets. And if you didn't get any in the first round, the second round, you need to stand at the front of the line to get the money for the third, because without you, business of education stops like we talked about. So be aware of ESSER is great for you. ECF going into year two, because the other one's done. Be ready, we'll talk more about that uh, after the first year when we know what their timelines are going to be. Uh, and we'd be glad to have these follow up conversations with you. Sterling's always willing to hold events and talks like this. And then be ready for the broadband growth because, in the new, they already have it, but in the new infrastructure, the new broadband piece, 65 billion is what it's talked about. Anchor institutions, government, education, health are all are going to be the number three priority in broadband growth, broadband infrastructure. Included in that is your network infrastructure. Included in that is your is cybersecurity is woven throughout it. So you got more money coming. And so be aware of that, but go, go get what you need now and let's use that money plan for that to carry you forward over the next several years. Uh, we'll, we can get in and have direct one-on-ones with you and, and bounce things off. I just did yesterday, four cities in Florida, uh, back to back to back to back. And it's, it was amazing how similar they were and yet how many different things they needed. And so trying to do a one size fits all doesn't work. Yeah, your populations, your stakeholders, your students are unique, your staffs are unique, your, your cities and counties are unique. And so let's build around what you need now and then later. And then also your wish and want list, because the amount of money that's coming through, we need to make sure you take full advantage of it. Uh, next slide, please. This is that tracking site at uh, US Department of Ed. And it's really a great site. So you can see with all three acts, 174.6 billion for K-12, the governor's fund 4.2 billion, and they can split that however they want to between K-12 and higher ed, although the third round funding that's not showing there, actually that is showing there, uh, they have to put 60.5% of it towards private schools that are dealing with low income areas. Uh, so, but that's by, by comparison, it's only 1.27 billion and then 60% of that uh, has to go to that. But that's, that's very, very small. And higher education has 74.9 billion, but, billion, but please be aware for institutions, you have the student portion, which is a little less than half that has to be spent on student relief, whatever that entails. And then the institution portion is the key where you can work on your cybersecurity, network infrastructure, hotspots, whatever you need. So realize the actual real number for, for you to be able to use for technology is the institutional portion at 38.15 billion. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an example of what's going on with the spending. Um, uh, Minnesota Department of Ed has $2 billion, and this is delayed, by the way. The last report was August 31st. And so this is typical. This is, this is not out of the ordinary uh, for schools across the, or for states across the U.S. Uh, they've spent 5.1%, so they've spent a little over half of their first bucket, and I'm sure they've allocated more than that, but the spend reports are what we're tracking. And so they've, they've got a little less than half they've got to spend between now and September 30th of 2022. They've spent 5.3 of that, so 31 million of that half a billion, over half a billion dollars for round two that has to be spent by September 30th, 2023, and zero of the 1.3 that has to be spent by 2024. So, Find out where you're at, because by the way, if you go to this site, you can type in your school's name and you can see how much you were awarded. Typically, it's only showing the first or second round, because frankly, the, the reporting for K-12 is lagging way behind higher ed. So it's hit and miss depending by state. Uh, higher ed had frankly more stringent um, reporting requirements than K-12 did, but K-12 really does need to start spending and turning in what that is because they are tracking that at the site and it's actually great information. I would definitely go to this site. So 
The other thing you've got going on right now is E-rate, because last year you got a brand new category two E-rate budget. And that was um, based on the number of students you have times X. So you that's what comes up with your budget. Now, the problem with E-rate, and we're trying like crazy on the last minute ditch, along with all these main, major associations, uh, COSIN, Shelby, said uh, tons of them, and the Funds for Learning is jumping in to support schools and E-rate Central and all these others, uh, Infinity, and, and plus us and the schools themselves are pushing to make next generation firewalls the bare minimum, because right now with category two, they only allow basic port protection is eligible, which is nothing. And that's like sticking a sponge in the Mississippi River and expecting it to stop it. They haven't updated the requirements for what they'll allow with cybersecurity, i.e. firewalls, since 1997. And frankly, we, we feel they've been negligent at the FCC in doing so because they allowed in the beginning of it firewalls to be eligible but never did anything to keep up with the pace of technology. And that meant out of pocket expenses for the schools. And that to me is negligence. You've been forced into this hyper transformation of a digital transformation. You've not been given the funding and the support to do the security transformation. So E-rate will cover you firewalls, AP switches, cabling, racks, et cetera, wireless controllers, and that's it. And on firewalls, if you're doing anything next gen or anything that really works, you have to cost allocate that out and pay for it out of your own pocket. So, and plus E-rate makes you pay a percentage based on your free and reduce. So if you're, let's say an 80% school, you have to pay 20% or 20 cents on the dollar for everything that's eligible, plus cover the entire cost of whatever's ineligible it's woefully inadequate adequate for schools. CARES 1, CARES 2, and CARES 3 have the 15 areas at latitude. You can use it specifically for technology. You can use it specifically for cybersecurity. You can use it for end user devices. You can't use E-rate for end user devices. You can't use E-rate for hotspots. E-rate will not pay for anything off campus. CARES, CARES 2, and CARES 3 are ESSER, one, two, and three, same thing, covers all of that plus everything E-rate does. And it's 100% federal spending with no local match. That's crucial. And the reason why, because we have a strategy, if you're not using it, we want to introduce to you today. Cool. Next slide, please. Hey, Jeff, just to check in, we got about 15 minutes left and a couple questions already. So sure, ask the question. Mind. One of the questions that came up here is, the SR or ESSER and ARP funding, can it be used for annual maintenance and licensing costs? Yes. And in fact, that's a, that's a smart way to use it. Use it out all the way to 2024 um, for your annuals. Make sure you match it up to the right buckets because then you have a zero OPEX hit on those costs that you would normally have. And then if you can, Re reroute or use those funds that you normally would have had to pay for something else or whatever you need to do. But absolutely use the Fed money as much as you can to be able to offset any OPEX hit that you would normally have with this expansion. Any other questions? Not yet here. Okay. We'll but keep going. And... Yeah. ESSER can be spent on technology and security, 100%. And ask, ask Sterling for the, in fact, there's the reference right there at the bottom of the slide, but hotspots for at section A21 talk cybersecurity, you are covered seven ways from Sunday to be able to use that for technology. The only battle you have to fight is with uh, local procurement, so your local decision makers, as, and, and hope you don't have any, you shouldn't have any, but depends on the state hurdles, like I know Texas Education Agency um, has a whole nother layer that they're doing. They're unique in how they're doing it. I'm not necessarily a big fan, but I get it for accountability, but 90% of this funding is to go to the LEA for you to be able to spend it. You have a, you have a responsibility 
to make sure you use these federal funds, not only for the other 14 areas of latitude, but to be able to keep up with the technology that's allowing these students to learn and securing and keeping them safe. Next slide, please. So right here, again, uh, there's several different areas. The ones in red are the one I'm going to refer to. Uh, facilities improvements to support remote learning. And it's wide on purpose. There's not an eligible services list. It's whatever you need to make that happen. Technology improvement and upgrades. And meeting after meeting after meeting, we get paralysis analysis because you're expecting handcuffs on this money and they're not there. The only handcuffs really are coming down from the state if you have any, but really it's the local uh, that you need to make these, rec these, these recommendations. And that's why putting the plan together is crucial. Next slide, please. Absolutely, we'll, we'll make these slides available. I know uh, Sterling is planning on following up with each of you as far as all of this goes. So for example, on the Fortinet side, here's the 15 second commercial. The, everything you see on here, all the voodoo that we do, you can use this money for. ECF can be used for the Linksys homework solution, which Sterling would love to talk to you about that. That's in our new hotspots with the Linksys mobile virtual network that rides on top of, uh, well, I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then all the other things that Sterling offers and, and along with uh, uh, the FortiGate solutions that we have here. By the way, we're the number one seller of firewalls into the K-12 space. Uh, some would like to think it's otherwise, but we can actually prove the numbers. But anyway, that's the commercials over. Next slide, please. So here's the Linksys homework. Uh, what we're doing differently is we, our Linksys MVNO, and this is the actual hotspot. You were playing with it last night and this morning. So Linksys Homework for Education, it rides on top of AT&T and T-Mobile, but it stays within the Linksys mobile network and takes you out to the AWS cloud directly where we have a massive farm of FortiGates in the cloud and then takes you out to the internet. And why does that make a big difference? Because we take all of the, the capabilities of FortiGates, including filtering, and we have a very strong filtering piece that filters it there. And, and then also we have uh, several layers of security, all the advanced security, because uh, you can't put any security on these because the feds won't pay for it. But if it's included in the cloud, they can, and that's what we do. So all the security you would hope for at your local school, we're able to do there at the AWS cloud. All that traffic does not have to be rerouted to the school. We take that heavy lift off of you. We take, these are zero touch deployment. And so Johnny, Joni, and Janie get on top. And one may have T-Mobile, one may have AT&T. Joni at the bottom is going to check for the strongest connection between those two, and it's going to grab that one and then take them through the linksless MVNO. Now, Verizon is still doing a CDMA to GSM conversion. CDMA didn't win in the technology fight, but they're about 18 months behind. But we have found out working with telco engineers and with Linksys MVNO network, 95% of Verizon is actually overlaid with AT&T and T-Mobile coverage. Even in Winnemucca, Nevada, which is way out in the middle of nowhere, I found that out. Uh, we were able to connect 27 different spots in a row around that county uh, and got, got the hotspots up and running and it blew away uh, the IT director because uh, he was told by that telco that only they had coverage absolutely was untrue. And we're doing that and we're finding that all over the place. So whether you apply for ECF and you weren't necessarily told the truth, uh, you can switch your ECF if you want to, and we can talk about that. Uh, or if you want to use ESSER money to backfill and you're needing hotspots and you're needing data plans, we can do that for you as well. Next slide, please. So this is our solution in our bundles, uh, 250 for the hotspot. Again, one hotspot rides on both networks. Uh, and again, that's the amount of money ECF will pay. So we're, we're actually uh, taking back a little bit of that cost and eating that because we want to have this type of solution. And then the funding uh, breakdowns on the right, but we can talk more about that specifically with you and Sterling, but we want to make sure you have that available. Next slide, please. What we're seeing in K-12 and also government, by the way, and we also have a government solution 
uh, that uh, for for the hotspots, it's actually much bigger. Uh, that will do an SSID for your your government side at home and for the family side at home. But that's another story. Here's what we're seeing uh, throughout, and we're seeing homework is be both the business solution and K-12 business. Uh, they're already pre-buying. It doesn't launch till December. Homework for education is already out. Uh, four to APs and four to switches because of the amount of devices as these students are coming back. Uh, it's really impacting the local area network. And, you, and four to voice, uh, the, the phone solutions, the VOIP phone solutions and soft phones for laptops, uh, we saw a 15-fold increase during the time of the pandemic. And NAC and, and our course of Florida Gates, all of those have been big, big sellers. And, and uh, we want to keep you, that way you can see what your peers are buying rather than just having me try to do a full commercial and sell you a widget. These are the top 12 uh, of what we've seen so far. Next slide, please. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is cares and bears and how to use it effectively. Uh, if you're going to do E-rate this year or you did it last year, and hopefully you did this, um, and, and Spartanburg did this. They had E-rate eligible and non-eligible stuff. And if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about how they use it. I think that's cares and bears. Oh, I need to tell you this. The gift waiver rule was reinstated last week by the FCC. So you can take and do uh, loaners and, and, and network equipment, Wi-Fi hotspots, you can take those and make sure those are what you need and, and without any, any undue damage to the E-rate program. So you can take whatever solution you need, bring it in and make sure it's what you want. And then if it is, then you've got ESSER, you can figure out your funding solutions. Next slide, please. Here it is. Uh, best practice for bears and cares uh, for E-rate 2021, uh, utilizing your, your ESSER money what we would recommend, let's say you have a million dollar project for E-rate and you're an 80% school because I need easy math. So it's a, if you take, you apply, you do the whole process, but then you use the build into the application reimbursement form 472, use your COVID money, your ESSER money to pay for everything, including your portion up front. Then you send in for reimbursement that money, kind of like the mafia, but that money runs through the FCC request. And when you're reimbursed, it's all local budget, including your 20% that you use CARES for. That goes back into your budget and you've had a $0 impact on your E-rate decision. And we saw it successfully used dozens and dozens and dozens of times with our people and other schools do it where we call it bears and cares because of the first E-rate act doesn't flow as well with bears and ESSER, but that's what it is. And we can, and Sterling can walk you through that process. Uh, next slide, please. Or is that the last slide? That was the last slide. That was anticlimactic. Anyway, uh, any questions? We wanna make sure we cover everything that you need. Jeff, a question has come in here. Does the homework solution qualify for the ECF and ESSER funding? Yes, uh, absolutely. ECF window is closed, but if you need it, and, and uh, this morning I had a call with the district in Texas, so they were having troubles with their original pa uh, pandemic buy. The, the hotspots were refurbished and weren't working, uh, so they're having to buy 2,500, and they're using ESSER for that to get them through this year, and then they're going to be applying for ECF with it in the next window this coming year. Absolutely. Perfect. And then one last one here. Can ESSER funds be used for professional development? Yes, please do. You need to have your staff trained up. Uh, we offer the cybersecurity training for free, but for other learning platforms or whatever you need, network engineers or teachers or administrators, you can use that for professional development as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we will be sending out this presentation 
We also are sending out a couple documents. One of them is a roadmap to help you on that discussion tree that Jeff was talking about. And the other is the link that was in the presentation with the funding. So we will send that information all to you. And as Jeff indicated multiple times, if there's anything that Jeff or the Sterling team can assist you with, please contact us. So thank you again for showing up. We apologize again for yesterday's um, switch on the time frame and the tep our technical difficulties that we had, but we're very thankful that you were able to make it work today. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.